Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back to the Collegiate Star League. My name is Joe Laguidas and we're going to be casting a terrific matchup for you guys tonight. We have Jig, or rather, uh, sorry, uh, University of Montreal versus UConn. This is a cool match for me because uh, I'm from Connecticut originally, so it's always cool to see those guys doing well. You know, they have a great women's basketball team, a great men's basketball team, and uh, a pretty damn good StarCraft team, if I am uh, if I can say so myself. They're going to be going up against the University of Montreal, who is a terrific team. They've got some really strong players. Coming out first here, it's going to be HJAX versus Jig on Echo. So uh, a great map to start things off. This is the first time we're seeing this map in... Um, CSL, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I know we had a map pool shift recently. Oh, no, that that is incorrect. I'm sorry. It's been a, a bit of a crazy day here, and this is going to be a solo cast due to some scheduling issues. You can actually check out the parallel stream over on uh, Fear of Dragons channel. That's going to be twitch.tv slash feardragon64, but without any further ado, let's jump into our game and introduce our players here spawning here in the bottom right hand corner playing for uh, UConn it's going to be our pink Protoss player HJX and his opponent in the top left hand corner playing for the University of Montreal it is going to be our red zerg player Jig I'll give you a quick rundown of these two players in case you guys aren't familiar with them. Uh, if you only follow the pro scene and you don't follow too much of that kind of high level, not quite the pro uh, scene, you might not know them. Jig has been around for a while. He's probably at this point the uh, the best French Canadian player there is. Uh, now that some of the other big names, or no, I guess Semper would be first, and uh, then followed shortly thereafter by Jig. Uh, and then H. Jax is a uh, He's a player that's been up and coming. He's been doing better and better on the ladder. And it's going to be interesting to see if he can perform. Uh, I think going up against Jig is going to be a real challenge for him. But uh, I also think he's well within the ballpark. Uh, both of these guys, uh, on any given day, one of them could absolutely defeat the other. I know that uh, h uh often favors an aggressive type style. Like the, the aggressive macro where you're not hitting some kind of crazy cheese, but you like to be mobile with your units, you like to be attacking, um, and you like to try to set the tempo of the game. I don't know as much about Jig's playstyle, uh, so we'll kind of have to let that go ahead and speak for itself here. Uh, it does look like Jig, or uh, HJX rather, going to be sending that probe out to get a quick scout out on his opponent. Uh, checks to make sure there's no third base. He's going to poke back in here again. He's going to be looking for what's popping out of these eggs because, of course, you never want to get caught off guard. Uh, you never want to get caught off guard by any kind of uh, zergling flood. That's something that can easily kill you. Um, and right about now is when you would probably start to see that mass of zerglings popping out of the eggs. Uh, it checks doesn't see anything that sets off alarm bells. And back at his home, he's going to be doing a pretty standard opening. Just getting a couple of depths out to get out on the map. Maybe try to pick off a drone here or there. Get that valuable scouting information. Then, of course, offer some kind of defensive anchoring. Uh, this first adept is going to be coming out here. It's actually able to push the Zerglings away and save that probe. Uh, really nice timing there. Worked it out by HJAX. And uh, they're just going to be kind of both these guys macroing up uh, quite a bit. Both of them are continuing to produce workers. Uh, this is the stage in the game where the Zerg wants to just be exploding drones. And so far, uh, HX hasn't been able to put on any kind of pressure. That has stopped Jig from that drone explosion. We see his worker count climbing up to above 30 now. And uh, it's just going to continue to skyrocket. H Jack still on just two bases for the moment. He's going up to three gateways, and uh, that's going to offer him a lot of defensive potential. He could also be uh, looking for some kind of uh, warp prism push with these um, uh, resonating glaives. Obviously, that makes it so his adepts take down workers faster, take down zerglings faster, do bonus damage to those light units. Uh, H Jack or Jig rather going to be coming in with the scout here. Um, able to see that his opponent is researching something on that Twilight Council. He's not going to be able to know for sure what it is, but uh, 
A player of Jig's caliber should be able to get that kind of read. Uh, there are some lings here out on the map. Uh, it doesn't look like they're going to be used for anything other than just kind of uh, gaining map control. And now comes the real push out here from H. Jax. He is moving out from these depths. And uh, this is that aggression we were talking about earlier. Instead of going on to a third base right now, H. Jax is going to follow this up with a dark shrine. So right now these adepts are going to they're going to put a lot of pressure on a jig. He's maybe going to flood units. Think this is what I need to hold on against, uh, especially once he realizes they have resonating glaives. And uh, then H. Jax is going to try to catch him off guard with the dark shrine follow up here. A lot of wings flooding out. Uh, H. Jax is going to need to control very carefully here. If jig is able to get us around, he should be able to take a favorable engagement. But a lot of drones already going down. Five drones have fallen. Now it's going up to ten. This is a uh, spiraling out of control. Uh, in a not great way for Jig here, as HJAX is just executing this attack nearly perfectly. A total of 10 drones go down here. I'd say that at least makes up for delaying the expansion of HJAX. What's going to be really scary is this next phase. HJAX, or Jig rather, is throwing down one Spore Crawler, and there are Dark Templar on the way with this Dark Shrine. Uh, this is going to be a huge counterattack out of Jig. Uh, he did juke back there, a bit of indecision. I wonder if, yeah, he did get the uh, vision on top of these links and oh okay so there's a uh, one spore crawler uh kind of tucked here behind the minerals that's a good position and jig is a smart guy he's going to hold position his links around that uh spore crawler going to try to ensure it finishes and so far this is looking like a really nice hold of the second attack but for just a moment those links move out of position and that's going to allow hx to take it out but the second spore crawler is not quite as vulnerable there's no surface area for those dark templar to get on top of and although HJX doesn't lose any of his DTs, he is forced out by uh, Jig. Just really on point defense there. Really well done. Uh, looks like the follow up is going to be more Dark Templar with a couple of Adepts. And uh, yeah, he is going to be making those Dark Templar into Archons. With the work percent, there's a huge amount of micro potential here. But HJX definitely has to make something happen. This attack is becoming very expensive very quickly so he's going to be looking to do critical damage against his opponent here uh jig has a really nice spread already he's got some banelings set up here and we're gonna have to see how h jack uh, is able to execute this he's gonna be actually attacking that spore crawler for a little bit there and that's gonna kind of trigger jig to send all of his links to get the wrap on top of all of these archons and the surface area for these archons is just absolutely enormous even though they deal so well with wings uh, just with all that surface area, the Lings will be able to flood and get the wraparound. This next follow-up is where a lot of the potential punch is going to come from. These Resonant Englave Adepts are going to be going up against just pure Ling for the moment. There are Roaches on the way, but they're not out yet. This could be a critical moment of weakness. With the Immortal follow-up here, I think HJX may be able to just kind of press through and try to make something happen. Uh, Jig has a mostly Ling-based army still. There's a few Roaches starting to trickle out, but I don't think this is the correct time to engage. Uh, Jig going to bleed off a few of his precious units absolutely for free. And uh, now at the back here, in order to try to set up to defend this attack better, he's going to be making some Ravagers. Now, H. Jax back at home is adding on his own third base. So if he can do some damage here, he's in a situation where he can catch up economically, but he can't lose this army for free. He dodges those Biles. Uh, very good swing there by H. Jax. Now these Adepts are going to try to get right on top of the Ravagers. Uh, another big wave of Corrosive Bile shots does come down here. And a uh, good pullback here by H. Jax. Doesn't want to be taking those Corrosive Biles. And the army of H. Jax just looks like it's starting to spiral out of control. But those were some incredible Bile shots. And now the army of HJX is quite a bit smaller. It's just stalkers at the back with one immortal here. Drones are being pulled off the line. Right now, Jig knows he has to hold. And it looks like with those reinforcing circlings trickling in from the back, it's going to be just enough here. The uh, immortal almost goes down, saved by a really cool juke from that warp prism. But these lings are just kind of chipping away at the army. And it's just shrinking with no real return on that value. And that's not the situation you want to be in. As HJX, he needs to pick up and get out of there. He's actually going to pull that warp prism back and potentially leave the rest of his army to die. Does he manage to snag that uh, immortal? No, he does not. And that's going to be a really painful loss here. Now HJAX needs to set up on the defense. These lings are streaming across the map. Uh, I think once Jig encounters that, he's going to feel um, probably not great. He's going to be pulling back. He's going to know his opponent has a saturated third base, which is a terrific economic position. HJAX actually has the worker lead here. He also has a small army supply lead. 
And I think his army at this point, uh, despite its lack of upgrades, is still stronger and kind of uh, more technical than the uh, Roachling army of Jig that Jig was forced to make just to survive. So we're going to see how these units interact in the next stage of the game. What's really scary for h Shacks though, is this Dropper Lord is loaded up with plus two Lings, and they could decimate this worker line. There's absolutely nothing in position to defend this drop. He's actually going to bypass that third base and instead go for what he hopes is an even more poorly defended main. And uh, he would be absolutely right to do that. He's going to unload in this corner. There's no vision here of h Shacks. Uh, just narrowly out of vision. Really perfect unloading space by Jig. And let's see what this run by can get done. Uh, this is that moment where you go, oh god, I didn't have the pylon up in that top corner of my base. I'm completely blind. And these lings are just shredding the probe count. Eight probes go down immediately. Uh, quick reaction by H. Jax. Pulling the probes does manage to mitigate some of that damage. He got a depth in position fairly quickly. And now he's on top of things. He's going to have anti-air to force this dropper load away. Even if he gets a bit more damage out of this. Uh, Jig is probably not going to be able to continue dropping indefinitely. But Jig bought himself the time he needed. Uh, he got his fourth base established. He can now uh, pump units out of four hatcheries instead of just three. He has a bit more creep spread here that's going to make any kind of further engagements on his side of the map be quite a bit easier. Jig has once again regained the supply lead, and now it's H. Jax's turn to be on that defensive back foot. Oh, Lings are actually going to sneak right by into that natural immediately, and they're going to get on top of all of these units. Uh, absolutely hemorrhaging probes right now is HX, and he needs to get the situation under control ASAP if he's going to deal with it. Okay, uh, Adepts are warped in here, and that's going to help him hold the line. Uh, it looks like the Lings might be able to trickle through. That's one of those gaps where occasionally they can glitch through. And yeah, Big Warpin does come in here, and that's going to uh, almost hold the line, but four Lings managed to get into the main. They should be able to get some more probes before uh, turning around and uh, getting cleaned up by h Jax here. Baneling drop goes down. A total of 30 Banelings have now fallen. I think at this point, if you're h Jax, you're on 13 workers. You take your army, you know that you have the kind of tech-heavy technical army. You walk across this map and you try to end the game right here, right now. That's going to be h Shax's final attack, I think. Uh, there's no way he can play a macro game from this point, but he still has arguably a better army. And picking off two queens at the back here is a promising start. He needs to make this disruptor count. This disruptor, in many ways, is going to be his everything, and that's a big whiff to start things off. He does have a second disruptor. Let's see if he can land it. Getting one Ravager is okay, but it's not the kind of shots he needs. Jig has the ability to reinforce to strengthen his army. h Jax is only going to get weaker from here. A single century, perhaps hoping to find some game-critical force fields here. Really nice arc for Jig. He's going to be able to come in from every side if he so desires. Uh, potentially huge disruptor shot goes out there, crushing some banelings, ravagers, and a lot of other uh, lings and things hanging out in there. So far, Ace Jax is playing this out well, but I'm not sure if it's going to be enough. Uh, Jig reinforcing with 24 zerglings at the back end of things is going to make his army a lot stronger very soon. Ace Jax may be able to snipe down this hatchery, but that's not going to be enough. He needs to end the game here. And h Jax, ooh, overshooting that Disruptor shot with just a tiny bit. Although the second one is good. Once again, we're starting to see a pattern here. Another Disruptor shot. Is h Jax making this happen right here? Uh, Jig decides it's time to move in. He smells blood in the water. His army is going to get on top of absolutely everything of h Jax is. And this army of h Jax is just shrinking very quickly. But is it quickly enough? Huge bile shots come down. Need to be dodged. They are dodged. And... It's starting to look like h Jax could potentially do this, but there is a massive, massive clock on him. Uh, he does have the army lead, does h Jax, but he needs to find a way to convert that into an economic lead or just completely destroy and degrade uh, Jig's ability to produce anything here. Ling's coming in once again, trying to get the wraparound on the weaker portions of this army. There's actually a single Dark Templar here to add a lot of DPS. Disruptor tanking shots, that's not really what it wants. The uh, Queen throws a Transfuse down, saving that Ravager. Really cool micro out of both players. I love seeing these scrappy, low econ situations. Uh, that was a really unfortunate Disruptor shot for h Jax. He needed to get that into the drone line and start doing economic damage. It looks like uh, h Jax made a valiant effort, but Jig is just holding on so damn well. I think he may have held this army... It's just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Drones are being pulled off the line, but that's okay. Jig has drones to spare. And I think we're going to be looking at uh, Montreal going up 1-0 versus Yukon. 
Uh, credit to H. Jax, he's not giving up just yet. It's a desperate situation, but sometimes, somehow, you can make things happen. But the loss of that warp prism is going to be it. GG is called, and that is going to be our first match. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when we come back, we're going to have our second match, uh, which is going to be... I'm sorry, our second match will be... Uh, Semper versus Rookwood. That should be a fun match to watch. Um, so don't go anywhere, guys. We'll be right back with Semper versus Rookwood. Uh, you're watching the CSL. Uh, we're going to hop into a quick sponsor message, and when we return... We'll have our uh, second 1v1 match. $14.99. Don't miss the call. Download Band. Communication made easy.
Ben, Sam, and Ken are on separate journeys to defeat the menacing vile dragon. But let's just say luck isn't on their side. If only there was a way for them to find each other and band together. Well, that's why there's Band. It's a mobile app that allows people to come together using common interests. With Band, you can find fellow gamers, chat, schedule gaming sessions, and conduct polls. Stage epic battles with friends while sharing videos and photos along the way. So try Band today. Band. Be together. All of your wind has gone and all of the path you've drawn have sunk to the ocean sand where no one can see. Don't let the dark embrace Cower the dreams you chase Under the rust and blood Don't let yourself give up Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back to the CSL. I am so sorry about the mic being muted in the last series. Unfortunately, it happened so quick that I uh, didn't have time to check my audio settings. That was a bit sloppy of me. And again, I apologize. We're moving into the next series, though. Uh, fortunately, that was not a match that needed much uh, in-depth commentary and analysis. So let's go ahead and hop here into this next match it's going to be a 2v2 between turkey dino and print f versus kraken and goon on mobius facility xx1 uh it's going to be a lot of fun and uh once we get through the player instructions i'll kind of walk you through why if you don't know who print f is uh you should learn he's a really entertaining a really unique player that has a stylistically cheesy way of playing uh, loading is at, uh, okay, here we go.
and spawning here in the bottom left hand corner playing for the University of Montreal we have our pink Zerg Kraken and our purple Protoss player Goon and spawning in the top left hand corner playing for Team Yukon we have our green Zerg printf and our uh, blue protoss player turkey dano okay so uh I'm, I'm gonna do something that's a little bit unusual for a 2v2 i'm gonna spend some time talking a lot about one specific player who's kind of our wild card here printf is a high grandmaster protoss player uh not a random he's playing random here in the csl but he is a high Grand Master Protoss player that cannon rushes every game. Now, when I say cannon rushes every game, I don't mean that he cannon rushes frequently. I don't mean that he cannon rushes 90% uh, of games. I don't mean he cannon rushes 95% of games. Uh, he cannon rushes every game. When I was at Chisadelphia, he said last season he played one uh, two, uh, two base adept build because someone donated him like $20 on stream or something like that. Uh, and that was the only macro game that he played. Or macro game. I'm putting air quotes. You guys can't see that. Um, so I'm not sure what he's going to do as a Zerg in a 2v2. It's definitely going to be interesting to kind of watch develop. But uh, Print F has chosen random for this. And I'm excited to see because he is such an interesting stylistic player. How he's going to play this one out. I don't know a lot about the rest of the players here. Uh, Kraken plays for Imaginary Gaming, uh, I believe, or Imperative Gaming, I'm sorry, um, which is a high-level Masters GM clan, so I would imagine that he kind of plays in that that region, that level of play. Uh, looks like the first bit of aggression is going to be coming out of Yukon here with uh, Print F making some wings. Uh, they're going to be looking for any opportunities to do damage here. They are walking across that map, and there is a big, wide, open entrance here, so they may find some very juicy uh, targets of opportunity. There's a single Adept out right now, a second one being corner boosted behind it, and with the addition of those Lings, uh, they can theoretically do a pretty decent hold here, at least until the rest of Print F's reinforcements join up. He has uh, stopped making Lings, at least for the moment. He's just focusing on getting those Queens out, getting that Zergling speed. Uh, I think the next few production cycles are going to be really important here. Um, Print F's units continuing to get on top of things, but not really getting anything done and actually being forced out of that fight. His uh, ally, Turkey Dano, taking another base of his own and adding on that second Stargate. I think we're probably going to be seeing a Phoenix Heavy style out of Turkey Dano. Um... Kraken on the other side of the map, just getting his bases, getting some drones up, getting that Baneling Nest for defense. The first Phoenix of Turkey Dano has arrived, and it's going to start uh, putting some hurt onto this Overlord, if nothing else. And it looks like it will cull at least one Overlord here. And uh, will he be able to get a second one? This kind of damage can spir uh, spiral very quickly out of control. Uh, once you start losing more than one overlord uh, getting supply blocked and then you overmake overlords and then you undermake them because you overmade them and you forgot uh, it can be a really damaging spiral we're not there yet obviously and actually on the other side of the map uh, we do have turkey dano taking some damage from those lings getting on top of everything print f able to uh kind of shoo them off there for the moment uh, we're going to see how the situation continues to develop here uh, Turkey Dano is going to be taking map control pretty strongly with these Phoenixes. Phoenixes are just really powerful in 2v2 because your opponent can have a powerful fighting land army and you can just control the skies. Uh, it kind of allows you to specialize in your tech paths a bit more does 2v2. And now we're actually starting to see uh, that snowball effect I was talking about earlier. A lot of these units on the ground are just going to be really vulnerable. A bit of a micro mistake out of Turkey Dano there, but Print F Zerglings flood in from behind to clean up absolutely everything. And it looks like uh, Yukon may be able to put one on the board here as they just continue to do damage nonstop. Uh, Lings are just piling on into this situation here. 
with Print F getting on top of the worker line. Uh, Kraken is doing his best to try to help defend his ally. It can be really distracting to have your uh, your opponent in your ear like, hey, come help me, come help me, come help me. But so far, we're seeing decent teamwork out of uh, Montreal, who is trying to recover and stabilize the situation. Okay. Uh, Goon is going to go ahead and take off all of the shields of his teammates. Nexus, that's a bit of a mistake out of Montreal here. And I think Yukon is uh, starting to take a really dominant position here. Goon is essentially gone at this point. Uh, he's down to under 10 supply, while everyone else in this game has above 50. I think that Yukon is going to put one on the board here. Very exciting for them. No one wants to get shut out 3-0. And I, I just don't, I don't know what else, uh, what University of Montreal can do from this point. Um, Turkey Dano's Phoenix Fleet just looks absolutely unstoppable. There's so little AA that's accessible at this point in the game uh, to a Zerg army, and there isn't a Protoss army left. So yeah, we're going to see these final probes get picked up. Uh, Phoenixes can kill probes so, so, so fast when you have this many of them. And uh, they even start acting kind of tanky, honestly. Um, Kraken is trying to kind of solidify his position here. Uh, he does have 36 workers, which is nice. But I, I'm just, I'm struggling to see what his next move is. That's kind of my worry because, you know, you can stabilize, which Kraken has done an admirable job of. But uh, at some point, the University of Montreal is going, or the University of Connecticut, rather, is going to walk across the map and try to kill you. Oh! Oh! Nice bailing hit. That's a that's a good move out of Kraken. Uh, Turkey Dano is kind of committed at this point to making sure that Protoss is never allowed to make anything ever again. And now he's going to get on top of all these overlords. He's going to supply block Kraken forever. He can actually trade inefficiently with these Phoenixes at this point. Um, they've gained such superior map control. I mean, he doesn't want to be throwing them away completely uselessly. But as long as he's making some kind of trade, it's probably a good trade at this point. Uh, the Team, team Yukon has double the supply... Uh, actually, more than double the supply of their opponents. Hydras are absolutely useless in these low numbers. Uh, every single Hydra goes down, and that removes the anti-air ability of uh, Montreal here. This is this is a grim day if you're uh, Kraken and Goon, but I do think that a big congratulations goes out to Print F and Turkey Dano for taking this situation and uh, really putting one on the board for Yukon here. Kraken is going to hang in there. Never give up, never surrender. I think we can all respect that in the world of StarCraft. And this huge Phoenix fleet is going to sweep in, pick off all the vulnerable probes. And uh, every time Goon gets any probes up, he just starts absolutely hemorrhaging here. Goon down to a single supply. I think Print F has had enough of this situation. He's going to A move all of his stuff across the map. And uh, Kraken is probably going to try to make a desperate hold. He's got about 30 army supply. It's uh, positioned well. That's one thing he has going for him, but I just, I don't know how you fight this army. It's its a bigger version of your army plus a huge feat of Phoenixes. And that's going to be just about the end of this here. Uh, GG is called by Kraken. GG is called by Goon. And that's going to put one on the map for Yukon. Congratulations to them. All right, guys, so that is going to bring the score to 2-1. to one. If uh, UConn wants to bring things to the ace match, they'll have to win the next map in the Archon mode. Um, we'll be right back with that, but the players participating in Archon mode are going to be HJAX and Print F versus Semper and Kraken. This is going to be a very fun game. Uh, don't go anywhere, guys. We'll be right back. We're going to play some messages from our sponsors. If you like them, you can check out Band at the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. And you can check out Asus just anywhere electronics are sold. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. <laughs> Don't 
miss the call. Download Band. Communication made easy.
Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back to the fourth and possibly final game of our CSL series tonight. We're going to be having our Archon match. If uh, UConn wants to stay alive, they need to win this one. This is match point, guys. This is a best of five, of course. And uh, Montreal has a commanding lead right now. Or not a commanding lead, rather, at this point. It's a, it's a one-game lead, but that puts them in a very comfortable situation. We are going to have... Uh, spawning in the bottom left hand corner here H Jax and print F playing as they pink Archon for Yukon and their opponents in the bottom right hand corner uh, playing as the red Terran from Montreal game closed apparently we spawned them in on the wrong map here guys it's going to be my fault, unfortunately. Huh. Alright, um, there we go. For some reason, New Kirk wasn't showing up in the searches, but we found it. We found it. Luckily, uh, HJAX, Print F, Semper, all high level players were able to point out. Uh, we didn't end up playing on the wrong map. That would have been an issue, of course. And now we're just going to get Kraken. Oh, you know what? We'll, we'll jump back over to my face. We'll get Kraken and uh, Print F in on this. Again, this could be our final game of the night, guys. Um, with Montreal having that 2-1 lead, they only need to win one more map to secure victory. And it looks like we have the uh, go-ahead from everyone, so we're going to go ahead and hop into this map here. All right, here we go. <clears throat> uh, on the correct map this time, the uh, we spawn on the HOTS version, which has watchtowers. Um, the Legacy version does not have watchtowers. There's some balance issues there with how they changed everything, of course. So spawning in the bottom left-hand corner, playing for the University of Montreal, we have the pink Protoss Archon. It is HJAX and Printf. And their opponents in the bottom right-hand corner playing for the University of Montreal. We have our red Terran Archon. It is Semper and Kraken. Semper and Kraken. Uh, it's an interesting team because Semper is obviously the strongest player in uh, this whole Archon match. But his partner is weaker, so uh, I think we're going to have to see some really good teamwork out of H. Jackson Print F if they want to take us. We don't see a cannon or a forge rather coming out of H. Jackson Print F at this time, which means we're probably not going to be seeing a cannon rush despite what a Print F is known for. So these guys are probably looking to play more to H. Jackson's strengths here. Now, uh, this first probe is going to come up and try to get a scout off. And uh, it's not going to see anything that sets off like big alarm bells. Uh, they don't need to be super worried about anything that this probe is going to see here. And uh, it's just getting, a, just getting a peek on the whole situation. Uh, now that it does have that peek of the situation, it's going to start putting some a uh, little bit of harass onto some of these SCVs. But Semper grabs that extra SCV, pulls it down, and he's going to uh, try to chase this probe away. Actually able to secure the second command center placement while there's still a probe in his natural. Just really nice micro out of uh, Semper and Kraken here. Great teamwork. Absolutely terrific teamwork. And uh, now the Red Terran. It's their turn to be scouting. Montreal is going to get that SCV up in here. And uh, they're probably worried about something funky coming down because... HX and Print F are both aggressive players. Uh, these gas timings may lead them to start uh, sniffing around for something, um, but it's not going to be any kind of crazy early aggression. Possibly 
some kind of early mid game tech pressure that could be very powerful against them. Uh, we're going to have to see though, the Reaper will be the second stage of the scouting here and that also kind of forces the Protoss to stay back and defend at home a little bit instead of moving out when maybe they'd like to be. This Reaper is going to pop right into the natural here. Take a look around and it uh, sees a single Adept, gets chased out. And it's just going to look for an angle where it can get that maximum level of scouting and information off. And actually the Adept is really well placed there by Print F and H Shax. Uh, managing to get a hit off on the Reaper and force it away. Uh, now that there's two Adepts out, one of them can actually bypass that Reaper with its shade and go some scouting of its own. So both these players should be, uh, or both these teams rather, should be playing with a relatively full hand of information. Now the uh, the Reaper does get into that back mineral line. Uh, Mothership Quarry is going to call down some photon overcharges that wipe out that Reaper. Going to be denying scouting here. And I think we're going to see a uh, very tech heavy pressure as the Twilight Council and the Robo are coming up. Excuse me. I have a feeling these guys do not want to play a macro game against the Titan. That is Semper, and instead they're going to be looking to just hit a really, really crisp timing. Print F is kind of a mad genius, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see something come out of them that could just uh, really wreck things here. Uh, scan comes down. Here, it gets a good, uh, good view of everything that's happening, so despite denying that Reaper Scout, uh, Semper and Kraken are going to be playing with full information. Uh, that's definitely a plus for them, considering the kind of aggressive stance that's being suggested here uh, by the tech choices of h and Printf. First Observer coming across the map. There's actually a second Observer on the way, so perhaps they're just worried about uh, being dropped to death. That is a situation that can happen pretty badly in PvT. Widowmine drops are so, so powerful. There is going to be that second Observer out on the way to provide detection here, and uh, we'll have to see if the forces can be in position. Uh, Force Stalkers are at the ready. Need to see a quick probe pull here. They're actually being pulled over the Widowmines are these probes. Uh, one goes down and manages to pick off looks like maybe one worker there uh the second one got another worker as well that's not really what you're ho oh no actually only a single worker perhaps they both targeted the same one at the same time uh that's not what you're looking to get out of a double middle widow mine drop so well done by hx and print f now it's their time to turn on the counter regression as these stalkers are going to be making their way across the map and uh looking to get some damage done Scan goes down here, reveals that there is some tech in play. Uh, the single siege tank will get spotted. Blink, I think, is done now. Uh, it absolutely is. So they can be putting that blink pressure on at the front. Marines are going to come down and try to face off against these stalkers, but they do get pulled back at the end there. And it looks like HX and Print F probably won't be able to do anything here unless maybe. They want to do something really risky, like position the observer in a way that allows them to blink up to the top, or bring this uh, warp prism over and go for a big warp in and a blink at the same time. There are moves they can make if they have their heart set on aggression right now, but I'm not sure if that is the correct move to be making against a team potentially as solid as Simper and Kraken here. Uh, Viking comes out, and it's going to be trying to do some damage against their opponent. Uh, does manage to get sniped down actually by H Jackson Print F, so good positioning there. Uh, second Marine though out on the map, showing the constant activity of our Terran Archon here, trying to make sure they have as much vision and information as possible when you're dealing with a potentially aggressive opponent. That's uh, really, really important to have. Semper and Kraken feeling confident, fire up their third command center here. And we'll have to see if they can hold on to the uh, double pronged aggression that looks to be coming out here from Printf and Hjax. Warp Prism going to be coming in, hooking around towards where they hope the blind spots are in this main base. There's not a lot of anti air set up to receive this. Uh, the Stalkers are continuing to poke at the front, potentially trying to uh, split the attention uh, between. Semper and Kraken are just focusing on gotta deal with these stalkers, gotta deal with these stalkers, gotta deal with these stalkers, and then if the army's out of position, Semper and HJX go in for a drop. Uh, 
Uh, still no real aggressive movements here. Doesn't look like uh, H Jacks and Print F feel like they have found a chink in the armor. So yeah, actually just expanding, continuing to power up, adding on those Colossus, but posturing aggressively. And now the Liberators start to come out with a big Doom Drop. That uh, that Warp Prism is going to serve as a huge early warning signal here. And, uh, it looks like Print F and Semper are actually going to be potentially turning around. They do try to snake the Liberators kind of maybe along the bottom here. Actually just going to leave them on patrol, make sure they don't uh, fall, succumb to any kind of Doom Drop. And Print F and Itchjax's is third base is up and running in a very good fashion. They're continuing to crank out units behind this. Uh, this army is going to be Colossus Heavy, which can be very powerful against a bio army here. And now it's time for uh, Semper and Kraken to go for that potential Doom Drop. The army of Print F and Itchjax is fairly out of position. There's three Stalkers in place to ward this off, but they need to react. Those Stalkers saw the Liberators. They need to move against it. Oh, it looks like actually Semper and Kraken going to go for that third base. And they went to where the defenses were, which is not generally what you want to do as a turn. They will yo-yo up to this main, but now there's going to be Warpins in time to receive them. They may actually end up losing one of these medevacs. Uh, fully loaded would be very unfortunate, but the target firing wasn't quite there out of print F and Ajax. They are going to follow up, though, with the Blink Stalkers. They managed to catch a fully loaded medevac. It's a really nice pickoff for them, but they will need to, of course, hold on against this uh, army pushing up at the front here. And there's a lot of Marines and Marauders, but not a lot of healing to back that up. And the DPS of the Colossus is very high. They're actually going to be able to force that away. And it looks like HX and Print F take a very comfortable position as we move into this next stage of the game. Semper and Kraken have, of course, secured a third of their own. They're continuing to drop mules, uh, make a few more workers, and then just pump out that army supply. It now looks like uh, HX and Print F actually forcing a lift off of that third. That's a huge deal at a point in the game when you want to be just focusing on cranking out that economy. And now they're going to try to force their way up this ramp. They want to make something happen here. Do HX and Print F. You're going to knock down that bunker. It is not a problem. And HJX and Print F are going to potentially push up this ramp. But no, with the siege tanks at the back, they don't feel comfortable pushing against this. They're going to kind of sit outside their opponent's base. There's actually a, a drop going down in the third of Print, uh, print F and HJX. That Disruptor goes off, but it's targeted down. Just a huge example of the damage you can put out with Archon Mode here. Uh, such a devastating drop, actually. Nine workers lost in total. And now it looks like these uh, medevacs are just going to kind of boost away here. Really unfortunate position uh, to be in as HX and Print F. Things seem to be going very well for them. But they're just taking a huge amount of damage from a fairly small commitment. And they're not able to make anything of their own happen. It feels like they're a bit paralyzed with fear here. Their army is stronger but of course, you don't want to be pushing up a ramp against Siege Tanks. That's uh, not a move that typically ends well for most players. They may be able to catch these Liberators repositioning, which would be a really nice spot to be in for them. Uh, one of those Disruptors gets a really nice hit, wiping out a lot of that bio. They're going to need to continue to be pressuring onwards uh, as both players claw towards maxed out. H checks and Pernef with a decent supply lead here, actually. And they're going to be curling around the side, looking for that ideal position. A Disruptor manages to snag a Widow Mine. Decent pick off there. Probably not enough to make this an okay engagement. But if they can find that right angle, HX and Print F have the kind of army that can crush with a good concave. Another Disruptor shot comes out and catches a lot of that bio. This seems to be going well for a Protoss Archon. The uh, Stalkers blink right on top of one of those tanks, pick a lot of them off. And both players are trading out pretty heavily here, but the trades seem to be favoring our Protoss Archon more and more. One concern I have is that uh, HX and Print F, uh, Yukon have lost a lot of their meat shield for this army. You don't want to be losing those expensive tech units, the Colossus and the Disruptors. You want to be trading out Adepts and Stalkers at the front and preserving those expensive uh, Robo units at the back. Uh, one Shade is going to come out here, give some nice vision, uh, kind of allow them to see the setup of their opponent. Uh, there are no Observers in play right now as far as I can tell. But it looks like they may be able to find a proper angle where they can maybe do some damage onto the mineral line, maybe get a wraparound on the army. Uh, obviously, this feature of the terrain is causing them to have a bit more difficulty here than if it were just kind of an open field. Uh, another Adept Shade going to come out here. Adept Shades obviously don't have as much vision as they used to, but they can still kind of get an idea of the positioning of some of these units. One scary factor going on, though, 
as H. Jackson Pernaf are going for another drop. We'll have to see if it can get any damage done here. And uh, there is now a cannon in play and a couple of Templars, but Storm is not yet done, which means they're going to need to be merged into Archons. Uh, one feedback does go down on the Medivac. That's going to limit the healing potential here. And uh, H. Jackson Pernaf... Are they going to choose to engage right now? They can take advantage of the extra APM offered by Archon if they feel their opponent's attention is split incorrectly. But they aren't able to find any damage right now. And uh, HJAX and Print F continuing to lose probes to this drop. And uh, the, one of the medevacs actually may make it out here. That would be very, uh, very nice for Semper and Kraken having another medevac to offer that additional healing at the back. Uh, over here on the right side of the map, we have Semper and Kraken kind of starting to creep across slowly. That Liberator count is growing, and these, uh, this army on the ground for HX and Pernef is just becoming less and less effective. They need to get Storm finished up, and they need to make something happen with it, I feel. A big warp in of seven Stalkers is coming in just as Psionic Storm finishes. That's an interesting choice. Uh, it makes me think that they want to continue to posture aggressively and contain here. Big Blink comes in, and they found that this is their moment to engage. Let's see if it's going to work out here. Uh, Liberators are continuing to rain fire from above. There's a few Templar in the mix here, but it doesn't look like they're going to offer all that much. A couple Disruptor shots go off, peel off some of this bio, but that was a very good trade for our Terran Archon. Very good trade. Attacking into a defended position means that the supply advantage has swung to Terran for the first time in quite some time. Uh, Semper and Kraken have kind of got their pseudo fourth base up. Uh, they're still only sitting on three command centers. They floated the main out to be at that fourth base, but that will give them that continued income. It's, of course, something you can do as a Terran. There's a bit of flexibility offered there. Uh, H. Jackson Print F are continuing to kind of shark around on the edges of the defensive perimeter of their opponents. They really want to make something happen here with this Archon, uh, Disruptor, Colossus, uh, everything in the kitchen sink composition. But so far, they're not having a lot of luck. And Semper and Kraken supply is just really starting to explode at this point. If we look at the production tab, uh, Semper, and, uh, Semper and Kraken are just cranking units out here. And uh, Yukon cannot match that level of production right now. The Liberators are starting to creep forward inch by inch. We may see kind of a slow death by strangulation here, but if this army sits under this uh, rain of fire for much longer, it won't be a slow death at all. And in fact, it looks like absolutely everything is going to be bled out here. Uh, every single Colossus uh, nearly falls. One man just to get away in the Warp Prism, but there's just so, so little left for a Protoss. Uh, they did manage to reset a lot of the supply of their opponent, but that was expendable bio supply that they were trading out very expensive technical units for that come from the robo facility that cannot be produced as quickly. And this is just a rough game for opponents. At some point during all of that madness, they even managed to lose uh, their fourth base back there. They've taken another one, but this is just going Terran's way in every way, shape, and form. Uh, they do manage to catch a Liberator out here. Any free pickoff at this point is going to be very nice for uh, HJAX and Print F. But I think they're going to need to pull a really cool rabbit out of their hat if they want to make something happen here. Uh, it's definitely not out of the question. The supplies are close enough. It would not be the craziest comeback in the world, but it's going to be a difficult one if they want to make it happen. Each engagement from this point needs to be perfect. There's no margin for error left, and we're going to start off with a Disruptor shot that only manages to catch a single Marauder. That is not the ideal shot when you're trying to claw your way back into a game. The Deliberators are hopping forward inch by inch, slowly, slowly chipping and picking away at absolutely everything. Uh, rings on rings on rings here, and they just can't push into those Freedom Rings and H. Jackson Print F are finally forced to significantly back off for the first time in this game. Semper and Kraken feeling comfortable. They've defended their side of the map. And I just don't think there's anything that H. Jackson Print F can do with this army, with this composition. They can potentially uh, just kind of try to seed territory as slowly as possible and transition into something else. But the production tab doesn't show they're trying to do that. It doesn't show they're trying to do anything. They've, they've mined out their main... Their third has lost a lot of workers. Uh, their fourth is about to come under attack by this drop. And there's a few stalkers in place to deal with it. They managed to catch one medevac, which is nice. But it's not going to be enough. And now all of these probes are under threat. 
uh, Semper and Kraken showing off the power of multitasking in Archon mode here. Absolutely terrific by them. And they're just going to continue to leapfrog. It's not going to be an instantaneous death. But I have a dark, dark feeling that death is coming. Nothing but stalkers being produced by H. Jackson Perneff. But at this point in the game, stalkers cannot deal with this many liberators. We have 11 liberators on the map versus 22 stalkers. You need more than two stalkers per liberator in this kind of situation, especially when you have only slightly overlapping circles. Uh, very, very well done by Semper and Kraken. Uh, HX and Printf started out strong this game, but I just, I think they're running out of moves to make. At this point in the game, I think they're more counting on their opponent to slip up, maybe catch some liberators out of position. They're now bleeding out kind of the end of their economy. They're going to lose this Templar Archives, which is an absolutely massive loss. And I think that's going to trigger Print F and HX to take the final engagement. You always want to spend your whole army. Maybe you can make a miracle happen here. But the bio is going to stim, move forward into those stalkers. Nice blink black. Blink back is going to save a few of them uh, for the moment, but that's going to be it, guys. It looks like Semper and Kraken is going to take this game and uh, take the whole series for University of Montreal. Really well done there. Congratulations to University of Montreal. Uh, I believe they've been on a strong uh, winning streak already. Yeah, it looks like uh, they are 7-1 and one in total here. And... They're going to be moving on to uh, they're going to be moving on to be eight and one. So congratulations to them. They're a team probably to look for in the playoffs. UConn's a strong team as well, but they weren't quite able to put up the results they really needed against a team like Montreal. So until next time, guys. Thank you for watching CSL. Thank you for being with me on the solo cast. Uh, be sure to check out our sponsors, Band Gaming. Uh, great social features, great organizational features. You can find them on the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store. And of course, thank you, uh, ASUS. Uh, they have absolutely awesome gaming products, peripherals, routers, uh, monitors, laptops, whatever you need. Check them out wherever electronics are sold. And of course, Twitch, the platform where you're watching this on. Uh, Twitch makes esports happen. It's a great broadcasting service. If you don't have an account, if you don't stream, you should try it out. It's a lot of fun. Uh, thank you, everyone, and we will see you next week. Ben, Sam, and Ken are on separate journeys to defeat the menacing vile dragon. Well, let's just say luck isn't on their side. If only there was a way for them to find each other and band together. Well, that's why there's Band. It's a mobile app that allows people to come together using common interests. With Band, you can find fellow gamers, chat, schedule gaming sessions, and conduct polls. Stage epic battles with friends while sharing videos and photos along the way. So try Band today. Band. Be together. And all of your wind has gone and all